Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're enjoying the delights of the French countryside. It's the chateaus of the Loire River Valley. Thanks for joining us. Awe-inspiring castles and palaces are scattered all over Europe, but no place is as renowned for palaces as here, a region synonymous with chateaus, the Loire Valley of France. This time we start with the grandest of all chateaus. Enjoy a river that marks the heart of France. Play with Leonardo's inventions at his last home. Admire the ultimate and graceful palaces. Feed the dogs. And eat well ourselves before enjoying the garden of our dreams. France has historically been divided by the Loire River. The chateau-studded Loire Valley is a two-hour drive south of Paris. Using the town of Amboise as our home base, we tour four unique castles, Chambord, Chenonceau, Cheverny, and Villandry. Because of its strategic location, the fertility of its land and its long and involved history, the Loire Valley is home to a dizzying variety of castles and palaces. The earliest were designed purely for defense. But when a valley address became a must-have for France's royalty in the 16th century, the old medieval towers were replaced by luxurious chateaus. The Loire River's place in French history goes back to the very foundation of the country. As if to proclaim its storied past, the Loire is the last major wild river in France. With no dams, it flows freely to the sea. We'll start with the biggest. Chambord is the granddaddy of the Loire chateaus. Far bigger than your average Loire castle, it has 440 rooms and a fireplace for every day of the year. It's surrounded by Europe's largest enclosed forest, it's a game preserve defined by a 20-mile-long wall and still home to wild deer and boar. Exploring the vast domain by rental bike, you can imagine royal hunting parties chasing their prey. Chambord began as a simple hunting lodge for bored nobles and eventually became a monument to the royal sport and duty of hunting. Of course, when it comes to hunting, good horsemanship is an important life skill. Throughout the region, it's not uncommon to see horses prancing and dancing. Starting in 1519, the French king Francis I had this royal retreat built, employing 1,800 workmen for 15 years. Francois Premier was an absolute monarch with the emphasis on absolute. In 32 years of rule, he never once called the Estates General. That's the rudimentary parliament of old regime France into session. This immense hunting palace was another way to show off his power. The architectural plan of the chateau was modeled after an Italian church. It feels designed as a place to worship royalty. This castle, built while the Pope was erecting a new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, was like a secular rival to the Vatican. Like a cross crowns a great church, the tip-top of the tallest tower here is capped with the fleur-de-lis, symbol of the French monarchy. Each floor of the main structure is the same, four equal arms of a cross branching off of a monumental staircase which leads up to a cupola. Grand opera hunting parties were held under these fine barrel-vaulted ceilings. Constructed for Francois Premier, his emblem, the salamander, is everywhere. The hunting theme carries on throughout the palace. This room features paintings and trophies from Chambord's illustrious hunting past. Typical of royal chateaus, this palace was rarely used. Back then, any king had to be on the road a lot to effectively exercise his power. That's why he'd have lots of royal palaces, and they sat empty most of the time. Back in the 1600s, 
Louis XIV spent a fortune renovating this place, and he visited only six times. Touring the lavish apartments of various kings and queens, you notice everything inside was designed to be easily dismantled and moved with the royal entourage. Because French kings moved around a lot, the entire court and its trappings had to be mobile. A royal chateau would sit cold and empty for 11 months out of the year, and then suddenly spring to life when the king came to town. Imagine the royal roadies setting up a kingly room like this, busily hanging tapestries, assembling beds, unfolding chairs, wrestling big trunks with handles just before the arrival of the royal entourage. The French word for furniture, mobier, literally means mobile. The fancy spiral staircase continues to the rooftop terrace, decorated by a pincushion of spires and chimneys. From here, ladies could scan the estate grounds, enjoying the spectacle of their ego-pumping men out hunting. On hunt day, a line of beaters would fan out and work their way inward from the distant walls, flushing wild game to the center. That's where the king and his buddies waited for the kill. The Loire River, gliding gently east to west, separating northern from southern France, has come to define this popular tourist region. The value of this river and the valley's prime location in the center of the country just south of Paris have made the Loire a strategic prize for centuries. Hence, all these castles. This river has long been an important boundary in France. Over a thousand years ago, when the Moors invaded Europe from northern Africa, this is as far north as they got. In World War II, when Germany invaded, this marked the border between Nazi and Vichy France. And even today, when people refer to northern and southern France, this river marks the border. Traditional flat-bottomed boats, romantically moored along embankments, are a reminder of the age before trains and trucks, when it was river traffic that safely and efficiently transported heavy loads of stone and timber. With the prevailing winds sweeping upstream from the Atlantic, barges loaded with construction material for the chateaus raised their sails and headed inland. Then on the way back, boats flowed downstream with the current. This transportation infrastructure was critical for shipping all the necessary stone, and the region's thick forests provided plenty of timber, firewood, and hunting terrain. It's no wonder that castles were built on the Loire in the Middle Ages. Long before the pleasure palaces, this strategic valley was dotted with no-nonsense medieval castles. The royal connection with the Loire Valley goes back to the Hundred Years' War, that's about 1350 to 1450. Because of a dynastic dispute, the English had a serious claim to the French throne, and by the early 1400s, they controlled much of France, including Paris. France was at a low ebb, and its kings retreated here to the Loire to rule what remained of their realm. When the threat finally subsided and the kings returned to Paris, many of their Loire castles became lavish country escapes. France rebounded and eventually tossed the English back to England. Still, the French kings continued to live in the Loire region for the next two centuries, having grown comfortable with the chateau culture of the region. The climate was mild, hunting was good. Dreamy rivers made nice reflections. Wealthy friends lived in similar luxury nearby. And the location was close enough to Paris, but still far enough away. For France, the 16th century was a kind of cultural golden age. With relative peace and stability, there was no longer a need for fortifications deep within the country. The most famous luxury hunting lodges, masquerading as fortresses, were built during this period. Extravagant chateaus like these didn't come cheap. They were the fancy of the economic elites, insiders who controlled the workings of the French economy. Of course, that all changed with the French Revolution, when the working class rose up, chased the bankers and financiers off their estates, and ransacked many of their palaces. Today, scores of these castles and palaces have been restored and are open to visitors. Modern-day aristocratic chateau owners, struggling with the cost of upkeep, enjoy financial assistance from the government if they open their mansions to the public. 
Straddling the Loire River, Amboise is an inviting town with a pleasing old quarter below its hilltop chateau. A castle has overlooked the Loire from Amboise since ancient Roman times. As the royal residence of Francois Premier in the early 1500s, little Amboise wielded far more influence than you'd imagine from a lazy walk through its pleasant, pedestrian-only commercial zone. The busy, pedestrianized Rue Nationale survives from the 16th century. Back then, when the town spread at the foot of the king's castle and was the second capital of France, this was its main drag. The Chateau of Amboise was the favored royal residence of several kings. Today, visitors can stroll through its peaceful grounds and enjoy commanding views. Here in the Loire, you'll notice the impact of the Italian Renaissance. When French big shots traveled to Italy, they returned inspired by the art and the architecture they saw. Tastes in food, gardens, artists, and design were all influenced by Italian culture. And Francois Premier did what he could to physically bring the Renaissance to France. It just made sense. The ultimate French Renaissance king invited the ultimate Italian Renaissance artist, Leonardo da Vinci, to join his court. The king set Leonardo up in Clos Lucet, a small mansion just down the street. In 1516, Leonardo da Vinci left Rome, accepted the position of engineer, architect, and painter to France's Renaissance king, and moved in. The 64-year-old Leonardo spent his last three years here, in the court of 22-year-old Francois Premier. Clos Lucet thoughtfully recreates the everyday atmosphere Leonardo enjoyed while he lived here. The Great Hall, where he received VIP guests, his bedroom, and the fine kitchen, which came with a chef provided by the king. Enjoying the patronage of the French king, Leonardo pursued his passions to the very end. This romantic painting shows Francois Premier comforting his genius pal on his deathbed. Clos Lucet displays models of Leonardo's remarkable inventions built according to his notes. Leonardo was fascinated with water and was brilliant in harnessing its energy. 500 years ago, when Leonardo was looking for work, the resume he sent to kings touted his engineering skills. It read something like, I can help your army by designing tanks, flying machines, water pumps, gear systems, and rapid-firing guns. The Chateau's grounds are a kid-friendly interactive park with life-size models of the clever contraptions Leonardo dreamed up. While parents relax, kids spin the helicopter, raise heavy stones with innovative gear systems, pump water upward with an Archimedes screw, ponder tanks and machine guns, and propel boats with paddle power. The pastoral Loire Valley hides countless castles or chateaux. While you'll likely visit several, it's important to choose wisely. Rather than seeing a string of similar palaces, we've lined up a variety, several distinctly different chateaux. While Chambord was grandiose, our next one is graceful. The Chateau of Chenonceau is the toast of the Loire. This 16th century Renaissance palace arches gracefully over the Cher River. Its formal garden, combined with the delightful riverside setting, makes it one of the great sights in all of Europe. The palace is lovingly maintained, with bouquets of fresh flowers adding fragrance and an included audio guide making sure visitors understand what they're looking at. Big fireplaces warmed big beds, while portraits of illustrious owners give the place a certain pedigree. While the tapestries kept the rooms cozy, they also functioned to depict recent history, to the king's liking, of course. These 16th century tapestries are among the finest in France. 
Shenanso was the first great pleasure palace. With its ravishing grand gallery spanning the river, it was designed for high society. Nicknamed the Chateau of the Ladies, Shenanso housed many famous women over the centuries. In 1547, King Henry II gave the original castle to his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. She added an arched bridge over the river. When the king died, his wife, the queen, Catherine de Medici, took over the chateau. She threw out the mistress, turned Diane's bridge into a fancy ballroom, and according to legend, put her own portrait above the fireplace in her rival's bedroom. Big personalities like kings tickled more than one tiara at a time. Mistresses were a routine part of the mix. Louis XV decorated this palace with a painting of the Three Graces featuring his three favorite mistresses. Now that's the arrogance of power. A powerful queen or mistress often managed to get her own private palace, even when the king's romantic interests shifted elsewhere. In many cases, the king or nobleman would be away on work or at war for years at a time, leaving home improvement decisions up to the lady of the chateau who had an unlimited budget. We're back in Amboise, and a day of chateau hopping puts me in the mood for an elegant meal. My friend and co-author of our France guidebook, Steve Smith, is joining us, as is so often the case, just in time for dinner. The rustic yet elegant Le Pisserie serves delicious and well-presented traditional cuisine and is a hit with locals. Its tiny kitchen manages just fine. Tell me what you're having and why. I ordered shrimp from the Loire River, so it's freshwater shrimp with tapenade. Tell me about this escargot, I love it. Escargot is famous in Burgundy. That's where it started, but it became popular. Every, every region in France seems to do an escargot. The rosé is refreshing, isn't it? It's summer, August in France. We drink rosé. Even escargot, red meat? It's perfect. Oh, here we go. What do we have? That one for them? And I will take this one. Oh. Thank you. Steve, these are classic dishes. Yeah. You have lamb. Mm -hmm. I have duck. Yeah, duck seems to be pretty common. In it is. Common. It's on every menu. It's normal. It's like the chicken of France, really. Well, when you look at the price, it's not that cheap. You're right, in a sense, but it includes tax and tip. That adds up to about 25%. Now that, people should remember that when they're ordering. It's included. Aurora, the restaurant's owner, enthusiastically introduces us to her cheese course. Hello. You have a local goat cheese, mm -hmm. all right? You have the saint maur de touraine sel sur cher Valencé, and Pouligny saint pierre after, you have some cow cheese. I have just one local cow. It's creamy and soft, and it's from the loire cher department, the name Le the Tro. You have strongazan, but creamy too, with the long from Champagne. If you like, uh, from Savoy, you have the Roblochon. Mm -hmm. From the north, you have Maroil, Pont l'Évêque, Normandy, Saint-Nectaire, Murol and Fourme d'Ambert blue cheese from Auvergne. So you have goat cheese and cow cheese. Yes. And it goes from mild to strong. Exactly. And it's like a map of France. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You visit different regions. Le fromage, bar rouge et pan. It's beautiful. C'est formidable. Every place we're visiting is within an hour's drive of our home base in Amboise. The drives are so scenic, you almost wish they were longer. The stately hunting palace of Giverny is immaculately preserved. Because it was built and decorated in just 30 years in the early 1600s, it offers a pleasing architectural harmony and unity of style. The chateau has been in the same family for five centuries. And the intimate details, like the wedding dress in the bedroom, are a reminder that the Marquis lives here to this day. Formal rooms, like this, with a fine 17th century painted ceiling and centuries-old suits of armor, feel like museums. But upstairs, the family quarters feel more lived in. The library shows a love of music and culture. The children's room features toys from the 19th century, 
And this clock does it all, showing the stage of the moon, day, and date. Its second hand has been ticking away for 250 years. When the revolution hit in 1789, many palaces were trashed. Some were even burned to the ground, but many survived. Some were lucky. Some had fast-talking owners with friends in high places, and others, like Cheverny, had a reputation for being good to their workers. And back then, a big part of chateau life included hunting, and still does. The Marquis hunts twice a week in season. Feeding time for his hounds is five o'clock daily. The hounds, half English foxhound and half French Poitou, get worked up knowing red meat is on the way. The master moves them out and spreads out the feast. The excitement is palpable. The trainer, who knows each of the 70 dogs by name, opens the gate and maintains discipline as the dogs gather at the concrete table. It's an exercise in canine control. Finally, he gives the signal, and it's chow time. The Loire, nicknamed the Garden of France, is blanketed with fertile farmland and dotted with historic farms. A short drive takes us to our final chateau. Chateaus all have impressive grounds, but one's a destination specifically for its landscaping. For my favorite gardens in the Loire, it's got to be Villandry. Finished in 1536, Villandry was the last great Renaissance chateau built on the Loire. And all the attention here is on its grounds, arranged in elaborate geometric patterns and immaculately maintained. It's a hit with gardeners. Like so many chateaux around here, this was the pet project of a fabulously wealthy banker. Jean Le Breton worked for the French king, Francois Premier, in the early 1500s. Well-traveled Jean was inspired by Italian Renaissance gardens. So when he built his chateau, he created this. The 100,000 plants, half of which come from the family greenhouse, are replanted twice a year by 10 full-time gardeners. Posted charts and maps identify everything in English. The place is lovingly manicured. Stroll under the grapevine trellis, through a good-looking salad zone, and among Anjou pears. The earliest Loire gardens were practical, grown in the Middle Ages by abbey monks who needed vegetables and medicinal herbs. And those monks liked geometrical patterns. Later, Italian influence brought decorative ponds, arbors, and fountains. And harmonizing all the elements was an innovation of 16th century Loire Chateau. Today's beautiful gardens at Villandry, a careful reconstruction of what the 1530s original might have been, are the result of generations of passionate dedication. The Chateau of the Loire Valley have been shaped by the ups and downs of French history, from defensive forts to luxury hunting lodges to the target of angry revolutionaries. Thankfully, many have survived the tumult of the age and have become appreciated as icons of French heritage. The Loire Valley, with its historic chateaus, has found a place in our collective hearts and is treasured by those who visit to this day. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. So when it comes to the menu, eat dangerous. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I can help your army by designing flying machines, tanks, gear systems, water pumps, and rapid-firing guns. So perhaps your great-great-great-great-grandfather used this sedan chair? No, because it's a secret. Look, it's a new one. <laughs>